what people I think appreciate again, like of how, how we approach things is because we are giving them that budget up front. And then they could say, you know what, that's really not where I'm looking to be. And then, okay, well, you can have this, but it only lasts you three years versus this other material that's going to last you seven years. Or, you know, sometimes you need to be able to pivot and show them why. This is the real estate investing experience. We get it. Real estate can be rough sometimes. And that's why we bring in the experts to talk about the experiences you won't hear anywhere else with your hosts, John Cohen and Chris Grinzik. going on guys welcome back to another episode of the real estate investing experience i'm your host chris grenzig with me as always is john cohen how are we doing no complaints uh friday um normally we'd be plugging our event but uh after this episode airs we will uh it will have happened but uh so far so good Yes, we have back-to-back-to-back recordings today, all of awesome speakers for the event we are doing. Um, By the time this goes live, um, it will be over, but I am pretty confident Charles is going to have some sort of post-recording way to watch. Um, The event for anybody who wants to go learn about it, it's called the Long Island Real Estate Revolution. It's called that because originally it was going to be in person, and then now we're all in lockdown. So it's gone 100% virtual, 100% free. Um, if you want to go check it out, it's the website is lirealestaterevolution.com. It's going to be all day Sunday. We're going to have a bunch of amazing speakers, and one of them is on today. Very excited to hear her story and learn about more about what she does um, because I have a terrible eye for design and a terrible eye for color. So hopefully I can learn something. Um, so with that being said, Diana, thanks for joining us. Hi. Thank you for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So can you take a couple minutes to tell people who you are, what you do, where you're from, your background, and stuff like that? Sure. So I'm the CEO and creative director of Inspire Design. Um, We've been in business for 12 years in June. Mm -hmm. And um, we're a brand consulting and design management firm. So we do mostly um, real estate, corporate, healthcare, interiors. And um, our clients are mostly uh, on the island, I would say. But we also do some things in Jersey, Manhattan. Um, and we become an integral part of their team to, uh, provide all these services from interior design packages, um, branding, building identities, uh, finished packages, furniture packages, artwork, signage, wayfinding, and, you know, pull these packages together for our clients full circle. Awesome. So is most of your business around, like, where is it focused? Is it, you know, residential? Is it, you know, it sounds like you do like some office space or industrial. And then on that side of it, are you doing it more for the ownerships? Or are you doing it more for the tenants that are looking for it? Um, so typically we partner with the landlords and property managers. Okay. Um, and then that kind of leads to a lot of tenant work and it's almost in the commercial end, but it leads to a lot of um, corporate tenants, healthcare tenants and put providing their finishes and um, packages for them as well. Okay. Awesome. How, how did you get, into doing this? I'm curious. So I started, I started my career um, at Winthrop Hospital. I actually went to school for graphic design, but then started doing interior design at Winthrop Hospital. Mm -hmm. I had volunteered there, gotten hired and kind of was there for seven years ultimately. But um, I saw there was so much opportunity uh, that was kind of um, not recognized in the design field and took what I knew from the graphic end, able to brand out interiors um, and what that does for a company, how it helps reinforce a company and pull that into how we were building. We were kind of, kind of built out of necessity, all the Mm -hmm. different components that we offer our clients. Gotcha. I love it. Um, So when you are talking with owners, landlords, you know, different companies, fix and flippers, do you ever have a lot of trouble um, communicating like, why people should be hiring somebody like you and why they can't just do it themselves? And if so, what is that conversation like? So a lot of, luckily I would say a lot of, um, most of our business has been referral business for like okay. the first 10 years. Last year was the first year we started doing like active networking and business development. Mm-hmm. Um, but we really were built on referrals. So most of our clients have found us because somebody was, was talking about, what kind of value we were able to provide them with. It wasn't right. just picking finishes is what we did for, you know, their positioning within their industry or how we um, 
the value we added and how it transpired to getting them more quality tenants and, and things of that nature. So I think people see that the inv it's an investment in their property or in their space or in their business, as opposed to being a cost or an expense. Awesome. Yeah, I love it. I know for us, one of the things we always talk about is because most of our properties are some sort of value add or distressed where it needs work done and it needs a rebranding and stuff like that. We're always talking about how to best, you know, redesign or, you know, portray the property differently. And like I said in the beginning, I have zero eye for design. Um, I can't do it at all. Um, when I got started in the flip world, kind of, and I would walk through houses with my mom, and my cousin, who are both agents and much better at this. And they'd be like, oh, well, you know, we'll do this with the wall and we'll put that in. And I'm just going around like nodding my head, like, sure, sure. Sounds good. Like, I just have no idea. So how do you, how do you look at a, a space or a property, um, a house and what is your process like of coming up with, you know, options for this? Um, and then, you know, giving it to the owner or the tenant to kind of take a stab at and understand. Sure. Um, I think what's great about the service that we provide is it's, it's all under one canopy. Mm -hmm. So, because we're designing the graphic end and also the interior end, it comes together as one thought. And, you know, it, it means a means of thinking about sustainability and everything else. It, it's not always cost effective either to do everything all at once or um, completely over. So cosmetic upgrades are very common in what we do for, for building renovations. Um, so a lot of times we're working with a lot of the existing structure and really thinking outside the box and how to mm -hmm. elevate that environment without, you know, doing a complete refresh. So um, a lot of times we'll do uh, conceptual renderings, things of that nature. A lot of times doing just the branding on the building alone gets people really excited about it. Um, and sometimes it's a phase, you know, sometimes it's, you start with the exterior signage, some marketing, and then you bring it in and you start to do that refresh from the interior perspective. Uh, we have a lot of great materials that can update millwork really fast. Um, there's just a lot of different, uh, knowledge that we have depending on what we're working with that we try to integrate to make it meet our clients needs. Awesome. Yeah. I know, um, when we look at properties and I know John, this is a big thing that you have a, a stickler for. Um, we always talk about starting from the outside in, um, you know, we're always talking about the, the exterior drawing people's eye in the branding, um, and stuff like that. And, you know, a lot of people, especially newer investors have a very tough time understanding that. Is that something that you've found true as well, that having people understand, you know, best practice or, you know, best way to do things is a struggle to communicate with different people? Um, I, I feel like most, most uh, investors or landlords that I've been working with, they understand that they need to redo the interiors. Mm -hmm. And often I'm educating on why they should be branding the exterior or branding the actual property. So mm -hmm. I do, I do, that's kind of where we see the difference here, especially on the island. Yeah, they that was one thing. Like a cosmetic upgrade refresh. It's just, I think that it, the building identity part is hard for, or something that they didn't think about previously. That, that's something that, you know, early on, <clears throat> I mean, when I, when I first started working in, when I was a broker, you know, buildings in, in Ridgewood and Brook Bushwick, they weren't doing that stuff. They were, you know, it was the, the buildings were the buildings. But when, when I got outside of that space and started buying stuff um, throughout the country, it was, it was totally different where you, you can't change the reputation of a bad egg by starting on the inside because a tenant or a new tenant or prospective tenant, the person you're trying to change was, you, you you know they'll go in there and they see the pictures online, but they get there and it, it still looks exactly how it looked. And it so when 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 you make that switch, you know I, I've been talking, you know, I've spoken to a ton of people, and they're like, oh, you know, we're inside out guys, and I'm like, who? That never works. I mean, it, it, depending on the situation, if you're taking a class A building and you're just going to renovate it, that's totally different. But a lot of these rehab projects and changing and and tenants, you, you got to show them that something's different first before you could go in and raise rents or increase the, you know, the, the appeal on the inside. Um, right. So it's, it's refreshing when someone in the business says that because I, I'm good at design, but I'd rather hire someone to do it all day long. I don't want to think about it. I have no intention or want to be the one that 
know, should we do this color scheme and this branding? So when, when anyone comes on with a relatively creative eye, yeah, I'd rather them pick everything and me make a decision than, you know, me try and reinvent the wheel. So it's uh, when someone else says that that's smarter than me, you know, that, that always makes you feel good. No, I think you're right. I think, um, you know, you, how do you have that visibility? You need that visibility, especially if you have new ownership and doing it from the inside out, you're just not going to get that. Yeah, I think it's, we've seen it a couple times on a few of the properties we've done where just a little bit of paint or a different color, just the people in the area understand that, okay, somebody else is in like, it's, you never see a, a same owner very rarely come in and just all of a sudden decide to redo the entire property because they have yeah. what they are. They don't need to do it. So I think that's a really great way to kind of announce ownership uh, change and that, you know, hopefully that new capital is coming in, they're going to fix problems that were otherwise there. Um, like I know if all of a sudden our office building got, you know, I don't know if you can really paint it, but all of a sudden look new on the outside, we'd probably be pretty happy because we know it'd be our heat and cooling would be fixed because it's always messed up. Um, so we'd be pretty happy about that. Um, but yeah, I think it's a great way to announce it, not only to existing, but you know, to people in the area and understanding that, um, do you guys draw from different things? Like whenever we talk about like our properties, we're always looking for like the local area and like trying to tie it in. Is that something that you guys put a lot of emphasis on? Have you found it works really well? Doesn't work really well. Just curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, we do actually. Um, so we just uh, completed 201 Old Country Road um, in Melville. We just did all mm -hmm. their cosmetic upgrades. And um, we do a lot of custom artwork, wall graphics, things of that nature. So for this building, we did a whole Long Island themed artwork. We did prints on metal, um, beach scenes and different things like that, but it all incorporated into the overall uh, theme and scheme for the whole building. So it really came together as one package. And people love, people love, um, location specific artwork we find so uh, you know a lot of our more um, metro clients we do a lot more you know manhattan style and theme kind of artwork and things of that nature and it's really well received people connect with it yeah i know just um you know i'm out east now i lived in the city i'm at my mom's place and when we were talking about you know coming in and she loves the design aspect of stuff but just for her place alone, it was talking about artwork and there was literally only one piece we could find that tied in the local area to it. And it was like the one thing we talked about getting. So yeah, I think all that stuff just ties a lot of things together and it's, you know, a lot of things that landlords struggle to think about. And one thing I really wanted to get your opinion on, and I'm curious how much you've dug into this is everybody is so, especially in our space where it's numbers, 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 right? Everybody is looking to maximize their income, lower their expenses and, you know, get the most value for their property. A lot of these things you can't point to where it's, Hey, if I do this to the cabinets or I make them nicer, I can raise my rents, especially for us. When you're doing different design pieces and you want to justify buying, you know, this, you know, designing this logo or using this type of style of signage, um, do you have any sort of way to, you know, justify the spend? Um, or is that something that your clients do on their end and they just give you a budget? How does that conversation play out? Sure. Um, so a lot of times we'll provide um, like a quick location plan of where we think these upgrades should be with a quick a budget associated with it, mm -hmm. just to kind of lay out parameters on like, this is where we think um, your money would be best spent. And then let us know what works with your budget. There's other, obviously there's so many different range of materials that we can scale forward or backwards as we need. So it just gives us like a nice, jumping off point before like, we don't like to design and then find out, Oh, well we can't afford to do any of those things or implement any of those things. We think that's a waste of your time. It's kind of, you know, it's a disappointing day on our side for us to, you know, come up with all these ideas just to find out that you're not going to be able to implement them. So we think that's the best use of, um, of time and resources. And it's also the most effective way to keep things moving forward. Mm -hmm. It doesn't put things on a huge standstill where it's like, okay, well, we definitely can't do this. At least you can do some scale of it and we can work towards that. So again, maybe it's, well, we're going to work with the existing carpets, but you know what? We can create these pockets of interest down a corridor using millwork or a feature material instead of redoing everything. Maybe you just add artwork. Um, we've created, um, we're about to launch actually our artwork uh, platform, which is called Upright. And um it's meant for organizations and for facility departments so that they can order artwork for their space. It's all kind of pre-curated 
uh, images, and then you could print on different materials. It's everything's you know either clear on acrylic, mounted with standoffs, and um, it's a nice easy way for you to make a quick upgrade to a space. Uh, and it's really easy to budget out as like a budget tool because again you have the different grades of materials and you can scale up or down as you need. But at least you know everything's going to come together in the end, which is like the huge part because it takes kind of that extra layer of design or hands-on management out of it. Yeah, I think that's really important because I know for us, you know, just even going through a lot of the design processes on a couple of our properties, it's very, you know, laborious and, you know, getting through and, you know, samples and things like that. I know, you know, a few of our properties and John, you can probably touch on it more with some of your past projects, just understanding conceptually what it's going to be and what it's going to look like, you know, sometimes it's just really painful um, and just takes a long time. So I think that ease of use and giving people, you know, tangible examples of what they can expect is probably what a lot of people are looking for. Right. We do have uh, think- our sneak peek renderings. So they're literally just renderings on top of a photograph. And usually that gives them enough of a concept of how this can be elevated without, um, you know, doing like big architectural renderings that are very costly. So mm-hmm. we, we tend to do that very often and, it, and we're able to provide options in that same respect. Um, so before we even get to actually selecting materials, it just gives, it gets people excited about it really and, and helps them to visualize. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've always found those renderings help, but for whatever reason, it's like you get so excited and then because it's a picture on a pic, it, it, when then you do it, you're like, okay, well, because, because the renderings look perfect, everything's great, and then, you know, the buildings change a little bit, but that's, that's, just, that's just the way it works. You know, there's no other way to do it. I know our property manager in Jacksonville, you know, she'll go out with paint and she'll paint like square, like 50 squares in the building. Like, what color do you like? I'm like, I, you know, that, that's, that's not really going to do it for me. <laughs> I like this color, paint this color. Let's see what it looks like. But yeah, no, those, those renderings are good. I mean, one of the projects we bought in Cincinnati early on, about probably five, six years ago, uh, we had this whole rendering done and I was like, this is going to be the best thing in the world. And, you know, four years later, it, it still has never looked that good, but really? um, that's because our, that's because our contractor sucked, but um, uh, <laughs> no, those renderings are, are great. And, and it's a, it's a very easy way to, you know, to, to make the, the project looked or, or it's just, it's the given owner that maybe has no sense of design. Hey, this right. is more or less what it's going to look like. Do you like it or not? Right. You know, a lot of times we'll do um, finished packages as well. So standard packages where we can create, you know, three pallets, something you can integrate. We've done it both in commercial and like a residential multi uh, rental um, unit. And in a, that was in Astoria, but we created just three, three different schemes that had all the same manufacturers. So they were all Benjamin Moore paints. So they were all Mannington floors. They were all Wilson art laminates and Corin countertops or whatever the case was. And they had, had upgrades in different grades, but it just gives, um, it, it provides a couple of things, right? It gives you consistency first in maintenance. It gives you buying power so that, you know, you, one, you know what you're budgeting for all these spaces, but then two, you're able to work directly with manufacturers. We, we help to facilitate that in a lot of cases so that you're getting the best discount possible because you're saying, you know what, I know I'm going to be doing X amount of work over the next three years. And, and you say, if you want me to use your material, how, how can we make this work? So um, we do that really often. We do it a lot with our hospitals. Um, and it just creates this, this nice system of, of operating, budgeting, and, um, and maintenance long-term. I think I want to change gears a little bit, right? Because I think in a perfect world, everybody would outsource design to somebody that's amazing and not have to worry about it. But we know that's not always realistic. We have to sometimes stay within a limited budget or you know we have to do things ourselves or we just have to go with different materials. So for the people that are, you know, doing fix and flips or just trying to design their own house, maybe do, you know, minor things, or even for somebody that's looking to renovate, you know, apartment spaces or exteriors, do you have any sort of, you know, you know, beginner tips or things you learned early on that really make a big difference that maybe not everyone would know about? Sure. Um, there's a product that we use a lot called Dynoc. It's from 3M and it's, um, it's pretty much a peel and stick, 
laminate, I would call it, but it's a vinyl. So mm -hmm. it wraps corners easily. It's a great way to update any type of millwork in common areas. Um, you can update cabinetry that way as well. They even have an exterior version um, that holds up as well. They do it a lot in retail, a lot in the hospitals. So it's, it's stronger than, it's like what they would wrap cars in. It's more similar to that, mm. but it has picking like wood. It has a lot of different um, abstracts and it's a great, it's a great material to integrate onto any project that you're looking for a quick facelift mm -hmm. uh, without having and, and, and the time for them to update that versus the time it would take for them to take down millwork and redo that. You know, like there's a lot of, um, a lot of perks on the other end by, by doing that sort of thing. Um, another material we've been using a lot often more recently is, um, core tech and there's a lot of variations, but pretty much it's, um, a luxury vinyl, um, plank flooring that sits on top of whatever your subfloor is. So again, mm -hmm. instead of having that time that it's going to take to strip, restain and seal your wood floors and, and try to make sense of all of that, you can light this down in a day and a half, you know what I'm saying? And it mm -hmm. just, it just keeps things moving. It holds up wonderfully. It looks great. Um, and they have really just really nice aesthetics. So, um, I'd say like those are two materials right now that we're pushing pretty often, um, because it, they just make sense. They make from a cost perspective, they make sense from a maintenance perspective, they make sense. And from a time perspective. So, yeah, I think, so that, that first thing you were talking about, is that like, um, almost like a fake wall type material? Is that what you're saying? It's, it's, it's like a, here, hang on. I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but I literally have a sample. So it's like a peel and stick and you can like lay it on any surface. So it's thin. It's just, but it has like a nice wood grain or different, you know, again, different um, aesthetics, but it's, it, it lays on, it's, it holds up and it's. I was about to say the durability, cause it's used in, you know, you know, I know you mentioned hospitals and some retail, so it's gotta be pretty durable. It is, it is. And it, it's, it's not, um, it doesn't scratch up. You can even put uh, like a, an extra coating on it. Like you did some in like a busy corridor. So then it's just like a coating you put on it to give it an extra like scratch or just resistance if you think you're going to need it. Um, so it's, it's pretty great. Awesome. Um, another thing too that I'm curious about is for us personally is we're always looking for how to make our units look as attractive as possible to potential renters. And we're in a, a lower, you know, we're not, luxury a class stuff where b and c class where it's you know we want it to look nice but you know clean and safe is more important than the nicest stuff however you right. also want to make it look as nice as possible so oftentimes we'll have a model unit that will stage with different furniture or you know little things throughout to make it look more homely is there certain things in your experience that you think you know obviously a bed but is there certain things that would go further in, you know, those spaces that you think would help attract more people than other things? Like, is it, you know, really good lighting is more important? Is it, you know, little um, accents here and there that make it feel like an actual home unit? Um, is it the coloring? Like, in your opinion, what do you think is going to make that go the furthest for your dollar? So you do mostly actual staging or do you do mostly 3D renderings, would you say? Is it actual. more people welcome? through actual yeah. mm -hmm. okay so um you know i would say a couple things don't overcrowd a space you want people to see it as spacious you know so no more than like three pieces in like a living room or mm -hmm. in any room really i would say just keep it kind of minimal that way i would suggest more um neutral colors on the walls don't do anything that's too drastic that the people will be like oh my god i hate that color i can never live here mm -hmm. um if you're going to feature something or you want to bring in a pop of color, do it on something like a fireplace or something, a backsplash, something that's easy to update. Again, this is, these are rental units that you're talking about, correct? Yep. correct. Um, so in, in that case, I don't know that they would be providing um, that, but I think you want to just keep it a little bit more neutral and classic for those purposes so that people can add their own accents and throw pillows and artwork and things of that nature to personalize it for their own, for themselves. Right. I guess maybe, maybe I need to clarify. It's not that they're going to move into this particular unit. It's going to be like an example unit. So it's like, Hey, this oh. is what your home could look like. Not like, Hey, here's, here's your, you know, not like we're furnishing it for them and then they can right. add on to it. It's more of like, we want them to see it and be like, wow, this looks amazing. I would love it if I could live here. My apartment looked like this. You, you know what I'm saying? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so then in that case, I would, I would then still keep it sparse. I wouldn't go like too crazy where you're going to put like a lot of tchotchkes and things all over the place. I would still Mm -hmm. keep that minimal. Um, I would call attention to like any built-ins or anything they have in that respect. Just, you know, if you're going to put accessories somewhere, kind of lay them out that way. Mm -hmm. Um, Fresh flowers, plants. I think anytime you can incorporate those sort of natural elements, that's really important because I think that warms up the space without going um, too extreme or too, you know, too heavy on accessories mm-hmm. and window treatments. I think just dressing the windows nice and, and simply, you know, um, curtain rods up at the ceiling so that the ceilings look taller, um, long panels, and again, just more of like a clean, comforting aesthetic, nothing too, too integral. That's good. Yeah. Cause I know I've never understood it. A lot of properties have started doing, um, and John, we saw it at, um, remember that Palms of Beacon Point deal. They started doing accent walls on like one of the, on one of the model units. And I wasn't sure if I thought it was a good idea or not. Cause it goes back to what you were saying. You know, you hear about it all the time in the residential space. Someone's looking to buy a home and they don't buy it cause they don't like the wall color. And it's like, well, you could paint that, but in a residential unit, you really can't. Um, so do you think that's something that, you know, if you tie in the color with your branding, that could be a positive, or do you think that's an, you know, kind of a unnecessary risk that could turn people off? Uh, for a model, I would say you can bring color, no problem. You can incorporate with your brand. I think that's great. But for the rest of the apartments, I would keep them still a little bit more neutral. Okay. No, I think, I think that's good. Um, John, have you seen anything from you know, other properties we've toured or other things we've seen or on other properties you've done that you thought was done really well or that you didn't like or you know, anything in that regard? Yes. Yeah, so I think a pet peeve of mine in, you know, in Jackson, Mississippi on downhill on Highland mm-hmm. Hills, the deal we did, uh, we had models and the cost of the models I thought was completely ridiculous and they were catering to not, anyone on this on, on this call it was like super old gaudy big and it was expensive furniture that she got and, and, and I remember I was talking to her and I was like we got to do better here because I don't want to spend this much money on a model how can someone because I think it'll you know always without the price right because as Chris mentioned earlier you know it'd be great to just say hey do this for me I don't want to do it but that also comes at a cost what is you know any tips recommendations or where to find you know cheaper alternatives and or visually aesthetic stuff that may be, you know, more catering to the demographic or, you know, whatever, whatever the demographic is, but where, where can someone take advantage of something like that? So it's not just, you know, a crazy expensive cost to get a model up and running. I would actually recommend, um, there's, there's several different websites. And for one, one of the names is totally fleeting me right now, but the other is Havenly. And it's an online platform um, where you're actually working with the designer. You send them your room uh, and they will actually populate it with actual furnishings that you can purchase. So they give you links to everything, specifications on where to get everything. Um, but before they get that far, they ask you for like a quick, like, okay, send me a Pinterest board of what you're thinking. So they have an idea of what style you're moving in and what's your budget. So they can achieve the look because they have all the different sources on where they can get X, Y, and Z. And it's very cost effective from a design standpoint because this is, it's like, this is part of their service. I I think it's, I want to say it's like between 75 and 150 bucks for them to source these materials, depending on how far you go. Um, And I think they mostly probably make their money off the products instead of the design services. So I feel like that's a great, a great, um, example of how you can kind of be creative with the models without you're still going to get something that's polished and comes together as one thought as, and you're not going to spend all the time, you know, looking for a couch online. That's, you know what I'm saying? This is, this is what they do. hundred percent. So I think that might be a great source. No, I think that's really good. What was it called again? Havenly. How do you, was that? H A V E N E N L Y. Awesome. And I'll, and I'll, um, for a Sunday too, I'll, I'll, get the other name of the other one as well. So I can share with everybody. Yeah, that'd be great. No, I think that that's huge because I think that's a really great cost alternative to get in some sort of, you know, design element where, like you said, I could look at 2000 couches and they're going to all look the same to me. I'm never going to know. I'll probably end up just picking all gray stuff because I wouldn't know how to put colors together anyway. So that's perfect. I mean, you know, for, from my standpoint, I'm sure a lot of people where it's, 
you know, if you want to mock up something very quickly, that's probably a great way to do it. So, um, no, that's, that's tremendous. Um, do you have any, I don't want to say like horror stories, but do you have any like experiences you've had where you think people did things wrong that you could share? Um, that you think would help steer, steer people away from it if they are doing it themselves, like you know, just to, you know, things you've seen people try to do or implement that you thought just really didn't work, um, and just would be a really bad idea. Um, let's see. Um, I, there's there's one client who for a while, you know, we did some really great things with them, and at some point, you know, we we put these systems in place, so they think they think like, oh, all right, well, I could do it if there if the systems in place. I'm why can't I just implement it myself? And after trying with like one or two spaces as major fails, like like this, they're like our largest client now because they just see how once you get into the routine and know that everything's just being handled and thought about then they can focus on building their actual business and, you know, working on filling, you know, um, in your case, like, you know, getting, getting the tenants, you know what I'm saying? So it's like one less thing, if you know, you could take it off your plate and it will facilitate your revenue streams on the other end. It's a no brainer, but sometimes our clients have like need to go through that process to get back to understand that. No, I think, no, that makes a ton of sense. I think a lot of times we take things for granted and things seem a lot easier on the surface, especially when you're, removed or you're outsourcing things to somebody else. You don't see the, the day-to-day effort of what going, you know, what goes into it. And, you know, beyond that too, you're not just paying for the service for somebody you're paying for everything that got them to that point as well. I think sometimes we get too caught up in the, you know, what am I paying them per hour for their service to do X? And it's not necessarily, Hey, I spent, you know, five hours designing the space. It's, I spent five hours plus, you know, X amount of years getting to this space where I have the experience and the knowledge and things like that. So, um, I'm sure that's got to come up before of, you know, why am I paying X amount for this service? Um, is that, is that something that comes up a lot or not really? Cause it's the referral business that you get a lot of. Um, yeah, it doesn't come up too often. You know, we tend to gravitate toward having some of our larger clients. Um, and, and there are a lot of repeat business. So, you know, one property owner might have, you know, six properties Like we're doing one for, he has buildings in Melville, he has buildings in Maine. So we're doing stuff in both locations right now. And, and it works again, because he understands the workflow and we, we put a lot of systems in place. I think when we first started, I'm, I'm very like type A organized and that got us so far, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, using different technology platforms, we use the monday.com platform now. Oh, Are you familiar so with it? Use it as well. Yeah. We just started like, Three three months ago, maybe. My favorite thing in the whole world. Yeah. So we yeah. do that. We, t- we that's how we manage. I mean, our entire office, I would say, and team, but also all of our projects and mm-hmm. um, even our clients. So, like for our, our larger clients, we'll implement. You know, we'll make um, a, a private board just for them, where kind of like work orders, which I think would be probably something that you guys can implement on your end. Um, But that's what we, you know, if they have something, something comes up, instead of sending me an email, just put it right into that specific project and we'll get right on it because then the whole team's communicating um, efficiently. So it's one of like the best things that we could have done for our business is put that in place. Yeah, And we're only like using it so little compared to how much, you know, I've been on a couple of webinars like the past couple of days even just there's like the sky's the limit, you know? We're we're doing, it's the exact same thing on our side. We're like, we're using this half ass. Like if we were a little bit better at it, but there's so many, there's so many things that come out and and like, you know, you get so excited, like, wow, this is going to help us out so much. But then you're like, well, how are we, are we even using it right? Like we're, you know, we're, we're playing around with it, but it's, it's been really helpful. And I think, you know, I think for your side, that's got to be super important because you know, everyone thinks they're, you know, like Mr. HGTV, right? Everyone watches those shows and they come in, they're like, I'm going to design this home thing, you know, this entire house for, you know, 1500 bucks at Home Depot. And it's like, that shit's not going to cost 1500 bucks. It's not going to work. So that's got to be tough. You know, the referral business obviously makes life easier, but you know, everybody thinks, and even when I renovated my house, you know, I went in with it. I'm spending this and yeah, not even close, but right, true. I'm sure everybody comes in with like these grand visions at, you know, prices that don't even make sense. And that's gotta be the hardest thing to, you know, say, I'm telling you, it's not, you know, you can do it for that, but it ain't going to look like that. Correct. Correct. And, and I think what people I think appreciate again, like of how, how we approach things is because we are giving them that budget up front. 
And then they could say, you know what, that's really not where I'm looking to be. And then, okay, well, you can have this, but it only lasts you three years versus this other material that's going to last you seven years. Or, you know, sometimes you need to be able to pivot and show them why. Yeah, you can have it for this amount, but why should you not do that? <laughs> and that's like, you know, the, the knowledge that we've you know, gained over the years on how, how we can help them be that resource for people. And when they see that value, that's kind of, that's why I think like having like, not limited amount of clients, but again, those repeat clients that have multiple properties is where it's kind of at for us. That, because yeah. That's got to be and, and that, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, go ahead. That's, that, that's the best. When you, when you know, when you're you know buying something and, and I'm, this is my go-to and there's no headaches mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to turn out to be exactly how I want, you know, that's got to make life real easy. Yeah, absolutely. And we do um, like material management too. So we'll order some of the products for them. Again, if we're working directly with the manufacturer and can structure certain discounts for them, they're not paying, you know, the construction manager who's, you know, marking it up because the sub bought it and the sub marking it up, you know, it actually ends up saving them a lot of money that way too. So in everything where we're charging, they're seeing savings on the other end as well. Yeah. I think what you were talking about with the, um the back and forth of materials. We literally just went through this on a property. Um, we have a 320 unit in Jacksonville. Again, that interior hallways, we were going to replace the carpet with like an indoor outdoor carpet. And everyone we spoke to basically said, you're better off going with like the similar vinyl plank that you were talking about to float it over that just because, you know, subfloor issues and you know, unfortunately the tenant base, a lot of the tenants we inherited had pets that they just let go to the bathroom in the hallways, which was a, a whole other problem, but you know, something we had to consider. And it was not even that just, you know, people tracking in, you know, rainwater over a few years and, you know, different things, That's the plank would just hold up significantly better for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years than, you know, even though it's indoor outdoor carpet, you're probably, what we were told was you're still going to have to replace it in you know, a few years, maybe five, if we're lucky. Well, that, that floating floor is waterproof as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, with pets and whatnot, it's definitely the way to go. Yeah, no. So we, you know, it costs us about, you know, three times more than what the carpet would have. But when we looked at it and just kind of did like a, a cost analysis, basically high level, but you know, the, you know, the ability to not have to pay it again in five years, you know, if they were basically saying it was, five years versus 20 years is what everybody was saying. And if it's only three times more, you're going to net out more over 20 years than you would in, you know, going with the carpet. Um, and also it just looks significantly better too. You know, indoor outdoor carpet is not the most attractive material you can use, especially, um, indoors with not the greatest lighting. So, um, you know, from that standpoint alone. too. Yeah. The maintenance alone to clean, you know, the dirt out of, because those carpets are very, they're chunky. So they do, you know, have dirt pockets where they kind of settle, but mm -hmm. you don't have that with the other type of floor as well. So from a maintenance standpoint, that's a, a you know, dry or a damp mop kind of situation versus mm -hmm. deeper cleaning. Well, that's the thing too, with the carpets that were there, there was um, a cleaning lady who worked there either part-time or full-time, I forget. And like every, you know, couple weeks she would go through and like deep clean all the carpets, but every time she would clean it just because they were so old, they would just, smell terrible and it would just take forever oh, yeah. you know now you can just eliminate a lot of that work and she can go do other things and keep the property significantly nicer because it's going to take significantly less time to you know mop or swiffer you know vinyl plank floors whatever i don't know how the hell you clean them um i'm just thinking what i do at home no, but um, it is. it's very simple yeah i mean it's significantly easier than trying to come in and deep clean or I don't even know. Um, what's that like the, the shop vacs with the water? I think that's how they do it. Right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, that's, that's gotta be brutal. That's gotta take forever. Right. And that's another service, another, another contractor that you have to hire and it just, it snowballs at some point. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I'm trying to think what else would be useful for a lot of our people. Um, do you guys do a lot of work on flips or not really? It's more of the commercial space. We do most of the commercial side of things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what we're seeing is the landscape is constantly changing, but in the last few years, um, there's been this, this huge shift where companies, you know, before we used to um, design healthcare spaces to, you know, they're meant to uh, comfort the patient and their families and corporate environments, we were updating those to um, just have 
you know, for the business to be able to attract new clients and uh, same thing with resident or real estate rather is, mm -hmm. you know, to have that same thing where well, we need to see more quality tenants. But now we're seeing the shift where companies are realizing that they need to create spaces that are going to attract and retain the modern workforce. So in having that shift taking, you know, the city has been kind of doing this for a while, big cities, but um, on the island, that was they're very like slow to catch up on that. And now these companies out here are realizing, oh no, like it's very hard for us to hire any sort of talent. Everyone's just going to the city because they have amenity floors and all these other things incorporated into their space. Everyone's not just sitting in a closed cubicle or whatever the case might be. So in seeing this shift, I think from a residential standpoint, we're going to see this big um, transition where everyone's going to start to buy houses on the island here. And, you're, you know, it's creating a space where people are going to settle down. And I think that's where we're going to see a big real estate shift. So a lot of what we'll be talking about on Sunday is going to be, you know, what the modern work workforce is looking for in the homes in specific. So, yeah. So what, so what are the shifts? Is it just like the amenity spaces that, cause you know, is it the amenity spaces Is it the common areas? Is it, you know, the type of workstation they have, you know, what did, what have you seen as like the most, common themes coming up over the past few years that are being incorporated? Uh, so we recently, well, recently, I guess it was a year and a half ago now that it finally completed, but um, are you familiar with the dealer track building um, in the South Service Road in Lake Success? Oh, so that was like one of the largest projects we've ever worked on, but it, um, it was 230,000. <laughs> Sorry. It's a beautiful building. Thank you. We did, oh, we didn't do the exterior. Obviously, we did the interior, but um, it was like a four-year project for us and um, 230,000 square foot new build. And they were literally building their New York headquarters. And we're, again, same thing, looking to attract and retain millennials out of Manhattan, get, you know, tech, they're a technology company for um, car, like auto technology, I would say. Um, and so in designing the space for them, what they were looking for, and a lot of it, I had already kind of positioned myself because we were looking to do more co-working spaces and things of that nature at the time. So, you know, the way people are working nowadays is way different. You know, there's not this one, one size fits all mentality um, where everyone's just sitting in cubicles and just they're there all day and they're just getting their work done. People want this work-life balance. So for the dealer track building in specific, I mean, they have a huge fitness center, they have basketball, volleyball courts, they have a cafe, they have a game room with the Xbox and the whole thing. Um, the way people work is different, you know, creating, um, points of dynamic for spontaneous collaboration. So almost, you know, I would say about maybe 40% of the walls in the entire building are writable. Uh, so they are whiteboards everywhere and, and all the different furnishings that support, support that kind of spontaneous collaboration, smaller huddle rooms for uh, smaller meetings. Um, and the furnishings right now are so great because they all are understanding that there's this, this is trend and how are they going to incorporate and support that. So um, even movable wall partitions, um, there, I mean, telephone rooms, there's all these different things that we're now incorporating to these spaces, but people are expecting this, like this is what they want now out of a space. And this is how they, this is how they work. This is how they operate. Um, and having that flexibility to be able to work anywhere as well as, you know, with uh, freelancers and things of that nature, where we're able to work from home. And obviously right now everyone's working from home. So I think we're going to be seeing a lot of these shifts and it's going to affect what people are looking for in residential real estate as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to ask with everything going on now, common theme is, you know, a lot of people that didn't think they could work from home probably are now going to be more open to it. Or, you know, now workers are going to want, you know, a day a week or two days a week to work from home because they realize they can get stuff done. Have you started having conversations with either any of these owners, other people in your industry, or do you have any thoughts on how this period is going to change that dynamic going forward? Yeah. Um, so there was a, a big trend that was happening, which is called Resomercial, where most of the spaces were being designed to have that residential feel, again, to kind of blend that work-life balance. I think mm -hmm. they were going to see the reverse of that. I think in homes, people are going to need to have, you know, unused square footage and need to be turned into office space. I think that big companies realize, oh, wow, you know, upper management who was kind of like, no, I'm, I'm, people can't work from home. I need to see what they're doing. They realize, you know what, maybe this does work. And if right now, or I would say more than a little bit more than 50% of um, 
like the heads down work was happening at a cubicle. Mm -hmm. So if that 50% of that work can, can happen at home and people are, you know, transition to doing that more long term, mm -hmm. commercial spaces are going to do a, a, one of a couple of things. And we've, I have been talking about this with a couple of people. Um, I feel that the brick and mortar spaces are going to remain. I think that they're, the space is going to be reappropriated. So, um, I think that they'll still have very branded spaces, but they'll be there for more for like networking and team building events and things of that nature where they can, you know, um, people can like experience their brand. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there'll be more like hoteling stations when people do come into the office. It won't be like everybody has their set cubicle. Interesting. I think that, so I'm sorry. I know I just said interesting. I'm trying to think of how that would work. So like people wouldn't have their own, you don't think people have their own dedicated workstations It'll just be like, I've got my laptop. I set it down wherever and do what I got to do. Yeah. It's like an office Starbucks. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, so I think that's, that's a possibility, um, which in, in my mind's eye, things, you know, people will start to downsize, take a little less space. And the other option is there's some, um, you know, more finance, financial companies, things of that nature, where I think they really do want their people for um, security purposes on site. And I think their floor plates are going to expand because they're going to want people in the office and they're going to want more space in between everybody. That's so interesting. I, I hadn't I thought of that. Like, more space. You know, there's like these well, two, good. like, I think, and I think there'll be some sort of blend of, between the two. It's funny. My wife's been talking about that. She's been saying, and she's like, you know, social distancing, it shouldn't stop, right? You know, give me, like, it should, it should continue. Like, you should move into the garage. But, but it's been, she's like, you know, this is, you know, people in people shit, you know, get away. Like, give, give, you know, you don't have to be on top of each other. So she's like, let, let it go on forever. Forget, you know, forget yeah. whenever they. I think a lot of people are going to feel that way, you know. Like, no, it, 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 to... makes, it makes a ton of sense. And like you said, I, I think they'll be, you know, I, I've been saying it for a while, you know, it, like that, the the people that need office space will always need it. They'll probably take bigger sizes. And I think the offices that don't need it, because now people are working from home and are more efficient, you know, they're going to have to, you know, maybe they scale down a little bit, or I never thought of it the way you brought it up. And I think it makes a ton of sense. You know, you know, Hey, this is where we go to, you know, instead of having to, you know, go to a hotel conference room to have like a team meeting or bonding, you can do that now with a more, you know, residential type feel, you know, whether it's, you know, a big TV or whatever, whatever you do in that, your office, I think it's a really interesting way to, you know, repurpose that space to make it usable for people. When most people might be saying, Hey, you know what, you know, we're done with the office, you know, it is what it is, but I think it's an interesting way to look at it. And, and it makes sense because, you know, people now, you know, I know I've been joking around because my cousins are you know significantly younger, you know, 10, 15 years younger than me, you know, the a millennial now it's like, you know, I mean, when we go to an office, like, I'm going to grab my computer and I go sit at Starbucks for the next, you know, four hours. I'm like, what do you want to be there for four hours? Well, like, you get your shit and leave. But people, you know, that's the new office. If you go to any Starbucks, you know, there's, there's 15 people in there with a laptop and that's okay. like, that's their office. That's where they work. I, I couldn't do that, but you know, be that as it may. Right. I actually, um, we were right before this all happened, we were in the process of redoing our offices, which is now at like a complete standstill, but we rented, um, a couple of days over at, um, Bridgeworks in Long Beach and which is a co-working space. And it was great. And like the amount of buzz and what was going on there, it was really a nice alternative to going to a Starbucks because you're able to focus and get your heads down work, uh, when you need to. It's not like, you don't have like a jazzy music going on in the background or whatnot. So it was, it, it, it was really, um, even we had several large meetings there because they have conference rooms and it was, it was great. It just really, um, I, I'm not sure what that looks like in the scheme yeah. of all of us now, you know, but it was a really great solution prior to that. So no, a hundred percent that co-working space, you know, they were struggling a little bit in big cities. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what's going to happen to that yeah. after this. Following um, it, I'm trying it, to. It's going to be interesting, but those spaces are great because you're also, you know, the, the benefit of those was not only just a really cool space, but it's also networking with, you know, like-minded people. So yes, you might be a designer, you know, but you might need someone that has a small startup company and, and it's, it's just, it was a good workplace. Now this may throw that into a tailspin and I think time will tell, but uh, I think incorporating that into like the regular office setting is going to be a pretty unique way to look at, you know, right. repurposing that space. I think it's a pretty cool idea. 
yeah. Yeah. entrepreneurship can be sometimes lonely. So I feel like the spaces were doing well for that reason, you know? hundred percent. That's for sure. I thought it was interesting though. You mentioned, you touched on like the residential side too, of incorporating some of the office stuff into it. I forget who I was talking to, but I'm curious how much that's going to be incorporated into new multifamily developments. Cause it's been a trend of micro units, micro units, smaller, 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 and now if there's going to be a larger trend towards people wanting to have that space to work from home, how are they going to incorporate that into these buildings? Is it going to be in the individual units? Is it going to be, you know, more amenity space is going to be driven towards a quote unquote co-working space um, mm-hmm. or private offices. Like I think you're going to start seeing like that side being incorporated into it where it's the, you know, there's going to be the work from home apartment building being built you know, in the next probably two years for, you know, the people that can, um, right. cause I know like my apartment, I basically had very little room to work from home. Um, and luckily I was able to come out here to my mom's place, which is much bigger than my apartment in Brooklyn. But, um, yeah, I think that's going to be very important for a lot of people. Well, that was like, even when, when I, when I used to work in the city, uh, you know, selling real estate, there was always like that cool, and this is always like my concept of commercial real estate. It was like the, you know, the mixed use live workplace, right? Like you had a studio above, but you're, you're, you know, you lived upstairs, but then you had your downstairs was your gallery or something like that. And there was a huge demand for it um, because, it, but that I could see going into the residential space. Like, you know, now they have like amenity floors of buildings and, you know, a cafeteria or a gym or a basketball court, but now you can easily see, you know, okay, residential, you know, maybe a smaller space, but there's a gym and, you know, work cubicles or something like that incorporated into a residential building. So someone could say, okay, I have a 400 square foot apartment, but you know, there's a, you know, a 2000 square foot downstairs, a 5,000 square foot, you know, third floor workroom that, you know, now I can incorporate down there and I can, I could be a little bit more flexible and have some more space. And I even see, you know, like even with some greenery or some outdoor space, I'm, cause I love like right now, the thing I hate is that my outside, I have no like area to work unless I just bring it out to like the table but I always said it'd be great to have you know you know something on overhang where I could have an out I could sit outside and do what I do because you know sitting at home in a back office in a room you know it gets you know you lose you lose your mind a little bit but you know there's nothing better than like taking your laptop outside and working out there because that's uh you know that's a pretty cool idea so I think that'd be really interesting um interesting way to uh you know you know, repurpose or, or, you know, something in the future. Right. And biophilic design is another thing that we've been incorporating for several years now, but it's that humans connect to nature. So what materials you bring in, it isn't just putting a plant out, it's natural materials, wood, stone, and incorporating that. And people have lower blood pressure. They're more productive. Ultimately it has all these ripple effects in a positive way. Um, so a lot of our spaces that we're designing currently always, we incorporate these principles automatically and for residential, like, you know, just having some of these sound, um, nature inspired materials helps just kind of ease that any tension you might have. So, so John, we got to get Don a whole plant garden to lower some of his anxiety. Once we get back in the office, yeah, he, he's going to need a couple plant gardens. <laughs> um, but no, it's interesting. I mean, there's that. John, you might know about it. I don't know if you do, Diana. That whole, um, there's those two developments in Bushwick where it's like the whole block is like now a building and the amenity space there is ridiculous. It's called, it's like the Knoll Street Apartments. I just, I'm just looking at it. And it was like, I don't really want to live in that area, but I kind of want to live in that building because yeah. I just think it would be crazy because yeah. it's like they have like, like John was saying, like a cafeteria, a cafe, a garden, they have mini golf. They have like, basically a track on the top of the roof because it's massive and i just think it's really going to be interesting how they incorporate some of this you know the outcomes of this period whatever they are into future developments because you know, yeah, people's be mindsets are going to change for sure right. um, you know i think you'll see a lot of shift also where people who are living in small apartments will seek to have either home ownership or do rentals more on island on the island or whatnot because i think um I mean, I hear people who are doing Zoom appointments in their bathroom because it's the only place in their house where they, you know, they've got kids running around, whatever it is. It's the only place that they're able to actually be by themselves, you know, and that's, that's not going to work. <laughs> I did, a, I did a, like a virtual meetup with someone I know and he was outside sitting outside on his porch and he's in a, he's in a like condo. He said, it's the only place, you know, my kids are running around. He was like, I can't. So he sat outside, but you know, I am one of them. I, 
trash home ownership to the nines. I hate it. Um, wish I never bought my house. But if I was in the apartment that I lived in now, I'd blow my brains out. So, you know, there is something to be said about being stuck in a small space. Well, you know, even if you have a thousand square foot, whatever it is, you know, we had five rooms, you know, there was a bathroom, a bedroom, a living room, uh, you know, if it combined into the kitchen and like a little home office in the apartment, you know, now I have a you know one year old daughter and at least I have a house now. So it's like, okay, I have a backyard and yeah. not having that yeah. space would be brutal. Like I couldn't Especially imagine. The parks are closed. You know, it's like, what are, what are these? I, I can't even imagine. Like I'm fortunate to have the backyard and the kids running around and the whole thing, but what, what, are, what are people doing? I mean, it's got to be, there's going to be ripples, ripple effects of that. No, I, th- I think, I think it's, it's something to be said about, you know, people wanting to, you know, okay, maybe not home ownership, but renting a house or something like that. Cause there's something to be said about having, you know, you know, I, I don't live in a 5,000 square foot house, but at least I have a backyard and, you know, I could walk around the block or something like that because living in an apartment during these times, you know, you know, I, that we'd probably be, you know, at each other's necks and it would be tough because you're in such a tight space. But um, that is going to be an interesting way to see how people think like, okay, you know, could this happen again? You know, where do I want to be? You know, you know, renting a house is not a bad alternative. So I think it's an interesting demographic or, you know, mentality shift that could happen because of this for all different, you know, for everything, not just, you know, multifamily, single family, commercial, whatever it may be. I think it's going to be an interesting turn of events um, based on what's going on. Absolutely. Awesome. I agree. I think that's a great place to wrap it up. Um, Diana, thank you so much for coming on. If people want to learn more about you, your company, get in touch with you, where's the best place to do that? Uh, you can follow us on Instagram, ID underscore, right? Underscore inspire design. And then my, my email address or my web address rather is ID dash. Um, I'm sorry, ID dash inspire design. Perfect. Exactly. Um, guys, thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you're not subscribed to the podcast, please do so. And if you are, please send it to someone that you think would enjoy it. Once again, Diana, thank you so much for coming on. This was great. Thanks for having me.